see you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Hey, we're back. It's been a week since we've talked to everybody and a busy week since the Flames bye week. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, um, half full or half empty on this one? Would you say the Flames are on a four-game losing streak or an 11-game point streak? Well, if you look at it, the Flames gave up points to everybody so that's obviously not good but when you only score six goals in four games and you come out with four points it's like yeah that's okay i guess not ideal obviously but three of the four teams that didn't matter whatsoever that we lost the game to them so it is what it is it, i I trend more towards four game losing streak than 11 game point streak because, you know, they need to actually score goals to win games and they haven't been doing that. At the same time with the loser point the way it is, I mean, those couple loser points might be the difference at the end of the year between the Flames making the playoffs or not. So at this point, especially for where we're at, I'd rather get the loser point. Oh, definitely. Me too. You know, I'd rather if we're going to lose, we at least take one point away. Well, let's recap those games. We haven't talked since the bye week. We did a special last week where we talked with our friend Kevin Olenek, but didn't talk about any of the games. So uh, the Flames came back from their from their bye week and took on the Jets. And the Jets were able to end the Flames' streak at seven games as Hellebuck made 30 saves, and the Jets got a 2-1 to one win in the shootout on this one. Overall thoughts on the Jets game? Well, you could tell that the Flames were coming off their bye week most teams that are coming off their bye week tend to struggle in the their first game back and calgary was flat for most of the game i do not think that the troy brower goal should have been waved off necessarily but it is what it is and the flames got a point against a good team you know it's i thought this was a really interesting game to see i mean we have to remember that This Winnipeg team was just a few short years ago, the terrible Atlanta Thrashers team. And to see how far they've come in a few short years is amazing to me. Like, this was a good hockey team to watch. Well, Atlanta slash Winnipeg, they, for years, have selected players that have been either first or second on my draft list. Uh, since like 2011 uh, when sh- they selected Shifley Shifley and Berchi were 1-2 on my list uh, for the Flames Patrick Steffen well it started when they went to Winnipeg you know that, well, that's before it, yeah. that I mean, they, you know they, yeah they put in they they inherited an okay roster and really I mean you know since they've gone to Winnipeg they've really upped their game and it's really cool to see that because when they moved there I thought they were going to be terrible for a couple of years oh yeah and they're, they still have a little bit of ways to go but they're on the right track and honestly I think for the central division they're going to be the monster from that division for a number of years because all of their good players are very young sort of like Calgary's and uh, I think that Calgary and Winnipeg will eventually be the two teams to beat in the West. When Dayoff was originally given that job when the team moved to Winnipeg, I honestly didn't think he would last long in that role. I thought he was a transitional GM, but he's done a really good job. Well, he understood that in order to build a contending team, you need to start in the draft. And if your team's just mediocre average like Atlanta was, your team has to be bad ish for a while and you have to draft smartly and like with Edmonton and Buffalo and Arizona they've been bad but they haven't drafted smartly and that's why they continue to flounder and where both Calgary and Winnipeg we were terrible and now we're not because the draft picks not only in the first round but in later rounds have resulted in quality players that have helped push both teams into playoff positions. Talking about a team who's not in a playoff position, our second uh, game this week that the Flames played since the bye week, and this was one I thought would be a sure win for the Flames. They took on the bottom feeders, the Buffalo Sabres, and Buffalo's gone on a bit of a tear since this game, a three-game win streak since, but... The Flames, again, couldn't get it done and lost in overtime as uh, Jack Eichel scored the game-winning goal. 
Anything you anything you want to talk about in this one besides the fact that Chad Johnson stymied us? Well, I was going to mention that it, if it wasn't for Chad Johnson standing on his head, it, that first line probably would have had five goals in that game between them. And but I kept thinking all game these guys should know how to solve Chad Johnson. Yeah, well, sometimes the goalie does good things, and like they know the goalies know the shooter's habits too, and. It's one of those unfortunate things that it is what it is, and Calgary always tends to play down to Buffalo's level whether we win or lose against them. I've noticed that for years. It's like each game against them has been a painfully, dreadfully boring affair, and that one was no different, really, uh, other than the Flames were pretty much skating circles around the Sabres and they just couldn't solve Johnson. The best, I think, description of this game is I saw a great meme on Twitter after this one. Do you remember in the mid-80s when they had those Scooby-Doo cartoons? And at the end, it would always be the bad guy saying, if it wasn't for you pesky kids and your dog, yeah. somebody posted one that said, if it wasn't for you pesky sabers and your goalie, with the fist wave. So that's pretty much it. Chad Johnson's yeah. still on his head well, on like, this one. Yeah, like the rest of the sabers are a tire fire. And, like, they deserve to be one of the worst teams in the league because they are one of the worst teams in the league. And that's not going to change anytime soon. So it was, I guess, you know, this was good in, in one way in that if we're going to give up a point, we might as well give up, you know, the points to Buffalo because it means nothing to either team at that point. Well, but even the... Time, you should be able to beat Buffalo. Yeah, even the loss to Winnipeg. Winnipeg is going to be one of the top three teams in their division. So it makes absolutely zero difference to us. Yeah, besides the fact that we should be able to... I mean, if we're going to potentially see them in the playoffs, true. we'll make sure we can beat them. Oh, true. But at the end of the day, like, is it horrible that each of those games resulted? You know, like, if say we lost the Winnipeg game and in regulation and won the Buffalo game in regulation or overtime... We're, we still have two points. So, on one hand, yeah, it sucks that they, they lost both. But the net result, who cares? And then the next game of the week was the one the Flames had to win and weren't able to do so. This is when our uh, division rivals, the LA Kings, came to town. And we, again, lost, but lost in OT. Tanner Pearson scored the winner for the Kings. I was at this game covering the game as media, and I got to say, the feeling in the press box was, what a terrible game. Like, it was a boring, boring hockey game to watch. Well, yeah. There, it, Calgary, the Monaghan and, goal early, I thought it would get people into it. I thought it would get the team going and the fans going. And by the end, I, even just looking down at the sea of red from the press box, I thought, wow, I haven't seen them this bored in a long time. Yeah, and... It is what it is. This uh, is one of those nights where the most interesting thing going was the wave. Yeah. And Calgary is entirely out of sync offensively, and you can see that uh, it, throughout the lineup. And it, it, especially with the Freleak injury, it makes the, the Flames basically a one-line team. And so if teams can shut down the Gaudreau line or limit them only to a goal or two then you're pretty much going to skate away with two points. And yeah, the Flames were able to break through with the absolutely stunning goal in that game, but that was it. And there's nothing else. And the Talking to Coach Gullitson after the game, he did say this team played a good defensive game. They were playing a really good defensive game, a responsible game, but you're not getting enough pucks on or near the net. Well, that's the case in each of the first three games. The Flames played well defensively. And if you're looking at just that, like, they only gave up three goals in regulation in the three games. Like, you can't really ask for much more than that defensively. So it's just that the fact that the Flames have no secondary scoring is the main problem. And thankfully, Froelich is going to be back tomorrow in the game against Las Vegas. But the Flames still need another scoring piece somewhere in the lineup because... They just need one. Yeah. I think as we get close to the deadline, it really tells us 
we do need to go out and get something to help with that secondary scoring. Yeah, because the first line can do their own thing. Like, they're going to score goals. They'll probably chip in one or two per game. It's just that you need more than that to win, and you only have parts of lines that are good, and that's the problem. You need to have all three parts on a line carrying their weight to a larger degree in order for the line to be successful. And, like, if you look back when uh, the Janko, Bennett, and Yager line was going, or Hathaway in the early part of his tenure this season, each one of those guys was carrying their weight and they were contributing. But as Hathaway struggled, the other two parts of that line has struggled. And since Froelich went down with injury, Kachuk and Backlund have been okay, but they're, they could have more. And it's interesting sometimes to really see who carries those lines. Yeah. Well, let's uh, finish up the week, and then we'll talk a little bit more about Froelich. Uh, the last game of the week, the one that just for the sake of pride, I wanted the Flames to win, and the Flames should have won here, didn't, was going into Edmonton for their first game on the road since the bye week, and ended up losing in a shootout 4-3 to our provincial rivals. Um, you mentioned it last week that these wins against the Flames by the Oilers are like their Stanley Cup, but this is, I mean, this is terrible. We just can't seem to beat the Oilers these days for two seasons now. Well, it is what it is. Uh, the Flames should have won this game. And who is Brandon Davidson? Well, he's a decent defenseman when he's with Edmonton, and he's not an NHLer anywhere else. But, uh, yeah. It, that was totally a game that the Flame should have won, and I can't really fault Riddick too much on the goals that he surrendered. It is what it is. This was the second game this week where there was a questionable uh, goal called back. I mean, as much as I'm a Flames fan, you got a question of that McDavid goal being disallowed was really the right call or not. No, that shouldn't have been. And that spurred a lot of talk at the All-Star break with Batman and others about, you know, we need to either redefine what goalie interference is or redefine um, what we do video review on. Yeah, and it's one of those things that, like, if you're having chintzy calls where, like, the guy's skate is, like, five millimeters off the ice at the blue line, does it really frickin' matter? You know, and... To me, no, of course not, because who cares? He's, you know, obviously onside-ish. Like, even if they just tweak that rule where as long as you're in the vertical plane of the blue line instead of skate on ice, that would be perfectly acceptable. But, you know, it, all of it, it's just they got to narrow the parameters so that way it's not guess whether it's a goal to, to right now. With well, each if goal. You, if you listen to Commissioner Bettman during the offseason, or sorry, during the All-Star break, he said, you know what, we have to assume the call on the ice was right. And only if there's an egregious dispute or an egregious change do we ever change it. But he said we have to trust that the official on the ice got the call right more often than not. And it seems like right now we're double-checking too many things. Yeah, and, like, I'm not opposed to, like mistakes getting corrected it's just when you're getting to the like needing the electron microscope to figure things out like well, you're it. you're point, getting just, ridiculous yeah assume the call on the ice is right and move on unless it unless a playoff game or a game that's going to take a team out of playoff contention you know at a calgary edmonton game it really doesn't matter in the end yeah exactly well, Matt, with that, the Calgary Flames are still sitting in a decent position, having picked up some points in every game. They now sit at uh, 58 total points, third place in the Pacific Division. We have Dallas and Colorado in the wild card. Dallas at 60 points, Colorado at 57. L.A. and Minnesota also, and Anaheim tied 57 right below them. So we're in the playoff race right now, but we're only one point up. We need to start getting things back on track after four consecutive losses. Besides Froelich coming back, which might help, what, is, what do you think this team needs to do to get back on track and start getting some pucks in the net? 
Well, they need to figure out how to score goals on the power play. That would definitely help matters because I think we're we've only scored one or two power play goals in the last ten games. So it's been abysmal. Uh, beyond that, I think activating the defense a little more to get them involved in rushes would help. But as long as they're keeping the defensive game up, the goals should come. It's just they they need to manage both playing well defensively and generating offense and it seems like the flames can't find that proper balance where they're either too offensive and giving up a whole bunch of ticky tack type goals or they're ultra defensive and they can't score at all because everybody's focusing on d so it's finding that find balance there and I think that largely would help it be helped by acquiring some other players well and you mentioned earlier that we have pieces of good lines but not a whole line and when I look at the lineups right now without Fro Leak on every line except for maybe the first line I say on each one of these lines there's dead weight and right now for me it's about getting rid of that dead weight whether that means some reassignments to the farm whether that means bringing some new guys in i mean if we look at the second line i think we could both agree that browers played better but probably not a second line caliber player right now yeah and he to his credit he has elevated his game and he's played well and frankly if he got slotted in on the third line for the time being with janko and bennett i think that would be a positive thing and I think Hathaway is looking a little past his expiry date right now. Same here. I think he had a great 8-10 games and then has disappeared into being an AHL player, like a Freddie Hamilton type guy. Yeah, to and me right now, I'd send him back to the A and just get him some play time. Yeah. And on that third line, I know I get a lot of flack for being a Curtis Lazar fan, but I got to say, I don't think Lazar is the problem on that fourth line. I got to say it's been staging. I agree. So I think, you know, whether it's bringing a guy like Mangiapani up and putting him with Bennett or Jankowski or putting him on that fourth line, I just think it's about getting rid of some of those dead weight guys. I'd even be okay if Troy Brower sat down for a couple games. I'm not sure that putting him on the third line is the way to ignite those guys right now. I'd rather put a fast, younger player like Mangiapani there. Um, but I think we need to really look at solidifying these lines and getting rid of some of that dead weight. Yeah, and frankly, the team overall, like if they could acquire another forward, that would be helpful, especially if it's a top six caliber forward. Even a middle six guy that can shoot the puck. Uh, like on the show that last week, you mentioned a guy like Gustav Nyquist, and somebody like that would be a perfect player to stick somewhere in the lineup so. the other name i suggested if i mean if we're not getting a guy like versteeg back who's got that veteran presence and now losing yager i bet we could get him for fairly cheap what would you think if they were to bring patrick sharp in that'd work too and he's good veteran guy he's got a couple rings i could see him fitting well in the second or third line yeah there's plenty of different options available the flames need another versteeg yager type guy just to slot in somewhere and right. where who that is and how much you're paying that's a question for another show but it's obvious that the team needs another player that can contribute offensively i think right now with you know froley coming back i would put froley back on the second line because we've seen the magic of kachuk back then froley i think that that line is better than the sum of its parts when it's all together. If it was me, I would send Garnet Hathaway down or sit him in the press box, try Curtis Lazar on the line with Bennett and Jankowski, and put Stajan, Brower, and I guess Lomberg together on line four. Mm -hmm. well, I just think yeah, and like if uh, the Flames do acquire some additional scorer... What I would do is actually swap the second and third lines and make like the Kachuk line more of the defensively responsible one and the new guy with Jankowski and Bennett as the second I agree. line. When I look at the lines, I think that it's the first and the third line that are really the scoring threats. But we saw Janko and Bennett 
doing well earlier in the season when Yager was with them, and now we need to find a way to activate them again because they've just looked really flat the last couple games. Yeah, well, teams can... If you only have one very dangerous player, you can isolate that guy. And, like, if, to use a basketball analogy, like, other teams would say that when Michael Jordan was playing, well, Jordan's going to get his points regardless. So if you defend all the other guys, then you might stand a, a chance to win. And it's the same thing with hockey. If you got a dangerous player on a line and nobody else to help him, well, you can limit what that one guy can do by focusing on his options and making sure that the other guys have no ability to help out and we're seeing that with the Jankowski and Bennett line because nobody has to pay any attention to Garnett Hathaway because he's not of a similar caliber as those two guys so you focus your defensive efforts on those guys specifically and yeah that... I, I know you're i know you're a big hathaway fan and i think hathaway probably has a place here as the extra forward i think he'll take what is now lomberg's spot but right now i'd send hathaway down and i let agree him get some play time in the a i agree and, and he's a good energy guy but he's not a scorer and he's a smart player but and he's being put on a scoring line yeah he's a fourth line guy and he'll always be a fourth line guy it it's just the flames needed him to be more and for a bit he was contributing as such but that's gone away yeah and i think you know maybe he's and you know i know that we like him as flames fans but maybe this was his cup of coffee in the nhl i think his role is easily replaced if he's not able to do it oh definitely you know, there's one of the guys that plays till he earns a million bucks and then nobody signs him and we find the next cheapest guy and lather, rinse, and repeat. Yeah. So I, I would agree with you about, you know, needing to be a little more offensive, activating the d- defenseman. Right now, the other thing I think the Flames need to do is just take some more chances. I'm seeing when I'm watching their games, they're passing one too many times. They're trying to get that sweet shot or that Well, th- that, perfect that actually... That is a symptom of the team Uh, the flames are basically set up as a team that has a lot of tangy and who's alias type players who are just cerebral thinkers and will set the play up the flames just don't have any aginla types that can actually like once those other the passer types are done doing their thing that can actually shoot the puck into the net and that's why a guy like Furland is having such good success because he's the like the only guy in the team that can do that and that's part of the Flames problem right now is that they just don't have any shooters and like they just they have plenty of guys that can set the table they just need somebody to put it in and they, they just I don't, don't have that. I necessarily agree with that. I think looking at the roster, you could have that. But I guess the word I would use is overcoached. Right now, everything looks like they're following a system to a T, and there's no room for guys to think on their own and say, okay, hey, this isn't exactly how it was laid out by the coach on the blackboard before the game, but I need to think as a hockey player and react differently. That too. They just seem overcoached to me when I've been watching them lately. So I think they need to get back to following their instincts, doing what comes naturally, and just taking more risks. And I think that's eventually going to, you know, if you put the puck on net more, you make sure you're in the right spot. I'm still seeing them not in front of the net when they need to be, and their stick's not on the ice. And just those little things that, you know, they need to be doing, it's going to help them. And they just need to go back to playing like they were before the break, just playing smart hockey. Yeah, attention to details is always a good thing. I mean, even you could argue that the Michael Furland um, misconduct in the L.A. game was just a lack of thinking. I mean, we could debate if he should have got a penalty for that, but, you know... Backland? Throwing, or, sorry, Backland, yeah. yeah. The the Backland 10-minute, like, that was just all... We could debate if he should have done that or not, but the rules are the rules, and, you know, the, to me, that was just a lack of thinking. Yeah. Um, I mean, good for him for trying to give a stick to a kid. He threw the butt end over the glass, the least dangerous part. But you can't throw your stick over the glass when you know when you're playing. Yeah, and 
situational awareness as well, because Backlund's the most important defensive forward on the team, and his presence for not being there for 10 minutes hurt the team. The other thing I'm noticing, and I noticed this especially at the LA game, because I was watching for it, but when the Flames have their whole lines out, they're fine. Like when you've got Goudreau, Monaghan, Ferland, or Kachuk, Bach, and Brower. But those times during the changes, it's like you the Flames don't know who the other guys are or what they should do or where they should be. And more than L.A. in that game, and I've watched for it since, um, in not just Flames games but other games, it's like you know your two guys, but you have no idea who the other guys in the ice are. And they're squandering some uh, some chances when you don't have full lines on the ice. Mm-hmm. And that's a little thing, but there's a few times when they were in the middle of a change, they should have got a shot off or they should have been able to do something and they didn't because it's like you didn't know where you were expecting that guy to be or you didn't trust the guy who wasn't on your line to be in the right spot. And I don't know if that makes sense Yeah, what I'm explaining. definitely. But, you know, you've got... Like, there was one time I remember seeing Goudreau... Monahan and I think Jankowski were out there because they were doing a switch. And it's like Goudreau and Monaghan didn't trust Jankowski, so they were trying to bring the puck in front of the net themselves. And Janko was open, and it's like, just pass the puck to Janko. But it's like, you know, we don't know this kid, we don't trust him, we got to do it ourselves. And so you've got to just, you know, from top to bottom, you're a team, act like it. Mm-hmm. But, um, so the question, and we talked about this a little bit, <clears throat> Froley comes back tomorrow. Where do you put him? Do you put him back on the second line with Backlund Kachuk? Yeah. Do you put him somewhere else? Yeah. Easy slot him in with the 3M line and see how it goes. If the 3M line didn't decrease their effectiveness with him away, I would have tried him on the first line. But I think that right now you need to get that 3M line clicking again. And the only way to do that right now is Michael Furland. And, I mean, too bad for Troy Brower. He gets bumped off there, but he had a chance to show, you know, he could maybe stay there and didn't rise to the occasion. Well, I think Brower played his best hockey of the season there, but he's not a second-line player. And well, that's it. Yeah, he definitely played better, but he's not a second-line player for a potential playoff team. Yeah, and he's – that's why I think having him on the third line would – like, he should be off the fourth line based on his play and like you have to reward him for not playing terribly and being a black hole on that second line he contributed it's just okay we're gonna give you another shot but with a different set of line mates see how you do with the the two kids and see if that works instead yeah, I don't think you can maybe rely on that for the rest of the season. Oh, no. Or at least give him a shot there and see how he does. Yeah, and you never know. They might find chemistry, or they might not, in which case you just go back to the way things were. But it never hurts to try it. That way you can see and know what is what. Yeah, I'm looking forward to Froley coming back, because I think if we can get that second line running, the 3M line, that could really get this whole team going again. So, Matt, the big news of the week is uh, Yermer Yager has finally said goodbye to the Calgary Flames. Uh, he was officially waived on Sunday. No team took him. I had a slight suspicion that Pittsburgh might have taken him so he could retire there, but nobody took him, and the Flames today loaned him to H.C. Kladno, the team that he owns in the Czech Republic. They're in the uh, second-tier Czech League right now. We don't have all the details, but it's assumed that the Flames will continue to pay him even while he's over there. I wouldn't be surprised if they worked out a deal, but um, as of right now, it looks like the Flames will continue paying him. So I guess the the big question is, what went wrong here? I mean, we were all excited. You especially really excited. Yager was coming in. We, you know, number 68 jerseys were the hottest thing in Alberta for Christmas. And all of a sudden, he's gone. And... I am hearing a lot of people blaming the team for this, but I think we have to remember he's 45 years old. That's old for a hockey player. And you've got to expect when you're 45, you're not going to be playing a lot of games. You're going to be hurt. You're, you know, like 
the these guys break down. That's when most guys retire at 35. So I think it was one of these things that we knew when we were bringing them in, we might not get a full season out of them. And to me, you know, we kind of got what we paid for. I mean, we only paid them a million bucks. So I don't think there's anything wrong with the way the run went with Yager. What are your thoughts? Well, I don't necessarily think that his time with the Flames is over. I think uh, because we can recall him. It's not like he's gone for good. The Flames still hold his rights and all that. It's just... We'll see. And if he has a good couple months in Quadno, I think that he'll be back towards the end of the season. If he continues having injury troubles, then he won't. And we'll see. But The only way I could see him coming back is if the Flames go deep in the playoffs and bringing him in, even if he doesn't play, bringing him in just to be the uh, you know a veteran mentor. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that uh, if he can go like two months of playing without getting hurt, then I think that he'll be fine to moving forward. It's just that, uh, like, prior to his first injury this season, Yager was playing as good as he was when he was with the Florida Panthers. And it's just that he got hurt, and then it seemed like he'd just keep re-aggravating the injury, and then more injuries would pile up, and more injuries, and right more now injuries. Right and... said that he has a groin and a knee injury. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, that's what happened with an older guy. I think there was a little bit of blame there, I guess, if you want to call it blame, but maybe a little bit of a regret from the Flames side that we brought him in so late. If they would have decided to bring him in in July or even late August, he would have had a full training camp where he might have been in better shape. And I think part of the injuries might be that he was trying to get in shape so quickly that maybe he wasn't doing it the way they should have been doing it because it's just, oh, they signed me. I mean, remember it took, what, like two weeks before I even got into a game? So I think that there's, I don't want to say fault, but maybe on both sides things could have been done a little bit differently. But do I think it was worth doing? Yeah, I think it was a great experiment. It was fun to have him around. It was good to see him here. I personally think we've seen the last of him. I don't think they'll re- they'll recall him from, from Claude, no. I think once he's over there, he's going to want to stay over there. But... You know, I, I think it was fun to do, and I think it just also highlights how desperate the Flames were to bring in a veteran right winger. You know, I don't think this deal would have been made if we had a first-line right winger cemented. What do you think? No, and that's been a problem with the organization for a number of years now, Is ever since the Gimlin left, is that we just don't have any right-shooting right wingers of any talent, and credit to Furland, he's stepped into a role on the first line and run with it, but... But that bubble's gonna burst soon. I not mean, not necessarily. Furland, he is getting more rounded in his game and is getting more creative in his play, so he By might... soon, I don't mean this year, but you're not gonna win a cup with Furland as your top right winger. Well, you could. It, it just would... You would need a legitimate first ish line caliber right winger for the second line though See, it's I think sort of like you uh, how you had who gets to a first ish caliber you swap them well that's the thing like if you look at like teams like chicago and pittsburgh like they had guys like marion hosa on the second line or putting taze on the second line and hosa on the first to spread the wealth a bit and I think that if Furland can continue to do the job then if you bring in that first line ish right winger you could have Kachuk with that guy on the second line and make two good scoring lines instead of just one yeah I know where you're coming from I also think that there's something to be said for having one really dynamite line with a couple of others I'm I still think that Furlan is going to be traded out of here next season. I think he's going to get more expensive than he might be worth, and he might be an asset that's movable. Uh, I agree with you. It's just we'll see. And, you know, it, we're... I mean, we all like him as Flames fans, but if you oh, look at Furlan, he's, you know, he's on, he's on the highest part of his career, and it's the Flames have a tendency not to sell high. 
And as much as I like Ferland, I'd say, you know, sell him while he's high. Get more assets for him. Don't do the Aginla and, or the Brower, or sorry, not Brower, Boma, and, you know, try to pawn a guy off when nobody wants him. And we'll see. Uh, we still have half a year left on this year and all of next season before Ferland's, you know, that's a lot of hockey to play in order to try and figure out what, Furland is long term is he just a good partner to ride on that first line or is he a legitimate player and we still don't know because uh, Furland is a bit of an enigma still so we'll see yeah and I mean his contract's over in the next year I don't see him getting moved this year because he is doing well on that first line but I think next year it'll be interesting he'll be I think a big storyline of next season to figure out what happens with Michael Furland mm -hmm. so with with the Yager thing I mean Matt if you look back at it in the summer knowing what you know now if you had that crystal ball would you have still done it if you were Flames management would you have undergone the Yager experiment oh definitely you you do that a hundred times out of a hundred he helped the other players on the team while he was here even just as a part-time player, part-time coach that he kind of was while he was here, that's worth the money that he was paid. And it's un I would have signed him earlier, so that way he could have got a full training camp in and probably would have been fine all year. But it is what it is, and that's what happens. And, I mean, if we look at him as a third-line center, I think it's fair to say he was a – or a third-line player. I think it's fair to say he was a third-line player for the Flames. What about you? Oh, yeah, I agree. If you look at those third-line veteran depth guys, I mean, we paid a million dollars. A million dollars to you and I is a lot of money. But a million dollars in an NHL contract is not that much money. And even if you look at the Flames roster, I mean, that's about what a guy like – Patrick Sharp or Christopher Stieg or those kind of depth the veteran guys are making. So for a million bucks, I got no complaints. If this was a five million or three million or four million dollar contract, I'd probably have more complaints that, you know, we're paying you this much, you owe us some hockey. But at a million bucks, it was a risk worth taking any year. Yeah, and it's also a thing, like, uh, I think that if it was a higher dollar contract, I think that the Flames would have terminated the contract instead of loaning them out. But we'll see. I, I'm i not 100% sold on the fact that he's done as a Flame, but we'll see. And I don't know, it the was press nice. release they put out seemed pretty final. Yeah, and we'll see. If Yager has a good second half of the season I think he'll be back uh, if not hey it was great having you here so you're looking at it more as a European conditioning stint yeah exactly and if he's in game shape and works out his kinks and everything's fine then I have no problem bringing him back it's just if he's good to go there's no harm in it so two questions for you. Do you see Yermer Yager playing in the National Hockey League next season? Possibly. I think that if he get, I think that his agent will say, sign me before training camp because that's why this season went off the rails. Uh, I could see a team definitely bring him in. And I don't think that we've seen the end of Yermer Yager. Yeah, in in North America. Or yeah, in the Flames yeah. organization. In North America. Do you think that if he doesn't play next year, let's just say the injuries are too much, do you think that he comes back to North America for the Flames or somebody else in an off ice role? No. Or do you think he stays in Europe? Uh, he he's not never gonna come back. <laughs> he he's a European at heart, and yeah, I. Uh, I don't blame him. He, 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 that's home. He owns the Cladno team where he's playing now. I wouldn't be surprised if we were to see him become the coach or the manager there um, or, you know, play out hockey there. I don't know what the compete level's like in the Czech second league. I can't imagine it's very high. Play there till he's 50 and just can't do it anymore. Yep. Um, he's probably still an attraction over there. Yeah, definitely. So at least, you know, at least the uh, traveling Yoggers didn't have to travel far to see him this year. True. 
and we actually got to see him in Calgary, so it, wearing a Flames jersey. So that was just an experience that made the million dollars worth it for all yeah, the Flames fans out and there. And for bragging rights, I mean, he said he'd never played for a Canadian team, and he really wanted to come do that. And I guess it's cool that that was with Calgary. Usually when you hear somebody say, oh, I want to play in Canada, they end up in Toronto or Montreal. And so I guess it was cool that that, you know, my one Canadian team was Calgary. Yeah. And, uh, you know, ever since I was a kid, like, I've always liked Yarmer Yager. Like, back when he and Lemieux were with the Penguins in the early 90s, like, the Penguins were my second favorite team because I liked the pair of them. And, you know, so seeing, like, one of the first players that I admired in the NHL growing up playing for my team, that's going to be cool no matter how long or how good he does. <laughs> so... Uh, you know it was just cool to see and just want to wish him all the best whether he comes back or not it's just it was good that he was here yeah it, it was fun for sure it was nice to see him it was good to see you know a real pro here i think it really helped like you were mentioned earlier some of the young kids like jankowski and bennett i think it gave them some uh almost some extra pep in their step. I know I sound like an old man when I say that, but, um, you know, it gave them something extra to sort of play for, of, oh, wow, we're playing with this legend. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's some dressing room razzing of, you know, guys, the old guys got, you know, better tempo than you. Pick it up. Let's go. Oh, yeah. So, and every time I saw him, I mean, you can tell he doesn't, he's not the most well-spoken guy. He doesn't like the media much, but he knows his role as a professional and he had all the time in the world to answer questions and, you know, talk to the media and he, he was a really good professional this year, which is what you expect from a veteran like that. So I think it was worth doing for sure. Two more little kind of misc flames notes for the week. Um, Tyler Parsons has been reassigned. He's no longer with Stockton. He'd come up for a little bit to play with the Heat. They sent him back down to Kansas. And Mason McDonald has been brought up to Stockton instead. My guess is this is purely just about minutes. If Parsons is the starter in Stockton with some unknown backup behind him, he's going to play a lot more minutes than he is going to be uh, trying to split that net with Gillies. Yep. Uh, and it was good that he got to see what the AHL is all about, so that way he has a better frame of reference, and we'll see how he does in uh, Kansas City, and hopefully well, I mean, Mason was, McDonald can... Earlier. Oh, I know. Well, hopefully Mason McDonald can step up his game and play well at the AHL level and assert himself as the uh, viable player, and... We'll see. Right right now, I think there's probably a lot of pressure on Mason McDonald because he's probably right now being seen as the odd man out of the Gillies-Parsons uh, pairing. So this might, this is probably Mason's chance to prove himself and say, you know what, I can... Right now, my question with him is, can he play at the AHL level consistently? And this is his chance to show that. Yeah, I can be an AHL guy. I can take that second AHL spot next year um, to either you know Parsons and or Riddich as the as the starter yeah and realistically a guy like mcdonald it, he's going to take until he's 25 or 26 to figure out whether he's going to be an nhl player and that's just the nature of goaltenders sometimes it takes a very long time for him to figure it out but as long as he's making forward progress towards that end goal then it's all good and sometimes you have goalies that it just takes a while for them to sort everything out and like take a guy like Devin Dubnik who struggled in his early part of his career because he was rushed to the NHL and he just it took him a while to figure out how to play at an NHL level and since then he's been a top tier goaltender and I think McDonald well, even Derek Riddick is 25 yeah and I think that McDonald is a goaltender he it's one of those weird things where all of the components of his game he should be better right now than he is and it if he can figure out how to get all the parts to work properly together he could be a good goaltender it's the whole if he will figure that out that is the question that will be remaining for a while until he does or he doesn't well, 
Well, the other thing that I think will be interesting next year is uh, the other Flames goaltending prospect, really the only other guy in the pipeline right now, Nick Schneider, is likely to turn pro. He's 20 right now. So where does that put Schneider in the whole thing? I can't see Schneider being more than an ECHL goaltender next year. No, I, I think he'll be the ECHL backup basically until some people move out of the organization. And, you know, I, I don't know how much value is there, but that's another piece I could see being thrown into a deal at a deadline or a draft day deal just to – I don't think there's – I mean, let's be honest. With McDonald, Riddich, Gillies – I don't think Schneider's got a hope and heck of cracking a you know a top spot for the Flames. Again, you never know. But you can't it, stockpile 100 goalies hoping one of them's going to make it. I mean, at some point, if you're going to cut bait, you probably say that McDonald's and or Schneider are the guys to cut bait on. All your goalies are belong to us? <laughs> no. Uh, but the, you know what I mean? Like, at some point, if there's an asset to be traded and you need to trade a goalie, you've got to say, which of these guys do you move? Right now, I'd say McDonald. I'd be... If the Flames move McDonald and got a decent pick or, a, you know, put him as part of a deal, I wouldn't lose any sleep. I wouldn't, you know, I think, okay, that was a movable asset. Or if the Flames are in a certain type of deal for a certain type of player, even moving Gillies wouldn't be the worst thing in the world either. Yeah, and, and I mean, we'll talk about this as we get closer to the trade deadline, but there's also the question right now that I've been thinking about, which is, do you move Riddich while he's hot? And that's also a feasibility. Because you have to look at, say, like a team like the Ottawa Senators. Yeah, they have Craig Anderson, but he's, I think, 36 or 37. Just like what, goalie. Yeah, but what do they have beyond that? And it's a steaming pile of nothing. It, so if the Flames were to, say, make a deal with the Senators... You would have to assume that one of the goalie prospects is going their way. Yeah, and I mean, right now, as much as we're seeing good things from, um, you know, Riddick, I'm not convinced Riddick is hand over fist better than Gillies. So no. I would say if you, if you, I think they're pretty equal, and he's just the guy who got the nod right now. So if you can move Gillies while he's, or move Riddick while he's hot to, um, you know, to get a good asset, then you move them and you put Gillies back in, in the number two spot. Yeah, well, I think this is more of a situation where, you, not, not to oversell it, but a situation like uh, Montreal had with Price and Halak, where both were NHL caliber guys. One was just clearly better than the other. Yeah, and Halak, I think, is an NHL quality starter. Riddick is not. No, and I think that both Gillies and Riddick are NHL caliber goalies, potential even NHL caliber starters, but Gillies is has the higher potential. So long term, I think that a team wanting an asset like a goaltending prospect would probably take Gillies, but you also have to weigh does Par is Parsons good enough where he then takes the mantle of the starter guy coming up and Riddick just as the placeholder backup 1B type guy until Parsons is ready, which is viable, especially if Smith can... like it, There's no reason that you couldn't, after next year, re-sign Smith to a one-year deal if Parsons isn't quite ready yet. Yeah, I mean, we're getting Vesna quality goaltending from Smith this year, but he's also old, and I'm not say, I'm not convinced he's not going to go downhill a bit next year. So I think we need to have a more capable backup next year to fill in some of those gaps that we might get with Smith. Yeah, but it's one of those things that you have to weigh, is the return you're getting mm -hmm. better than keeping Gillies or Riddick or Parsons or whatever? It just depends, and that that's part of the fun of seeing how a trade will foment and, and develop. And Matt, I, lo I looked it up. I think uh, in Ottawa they have a different pronunciation than you do. Steaming pile of nothing. It looks like they pronounce it Mike Condon. Yeah, as I said. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's a different pronunciation. Yeah. So they say it differently in the yeah, East. It, it's, a, it's the French pronunciation. There you go. <laughs> Mike Condon. Yes. So that's who's bad. I didn't even know Mike Condon was still around. Yeah. This is like Dave Abisher or whatever his name was. He was always around, and you're like, 
how's this guy still here? What's he still doing yeah. around here? Yeah. Or Peter Budai or Stefan yeah, Fusse exactly. or, like, you know, a whole bunch you know, of different guys. Or, and it's or like, uh, who's the goalie that keeps getting moved this year? Uh, Anti Niemi. There you go. Yeah, it's like, oh, Niemi's still around? Okay. And somebody claimed him? Somebody actually wants him? Wow. Um, the last Flames thing I thought we'd talk about, there's a strong rumor right now that the Calgary Flames might be one of the teams going overseas next year to play some exhibition games. Uh, they lasted this, I think it was, what, 97 or 99 when they played against uh, Vancouver in Japan? Yeah. I'd have to look back at exactly what year. But the rumor yeah. is this year the Flames might play the Boston Bruins in China. And the whole thing just seems weird to me. I mean, if you're going to send somebody over there for a special game, why would you not send, like, Calgary-Vancouver or Calgary-Edmonton? Why do you send Calgary and Boston? It just seems like a very weird weird pairing well, to go over. Like, and even if you games. took, like, Calgary and Montreal or Calgary and Tampa, where there's some history between the two teams via the Stanley Cup Finals, like, it, at least there's something, but... I can't remember a memorable Calgary Boston game at any point ever. So it just seems like they'd pick two random teams out of a hat and said, "Okay, you guys are going over there." Yeah. Well, I think they to- had Ottawa and Colorado going to uh Sweden this year, so but I guess if you're trying to sell the game overseas, you want to sell, you know, a, a rivalry. Like I think if you if you sent the Battle of Alberta over there, you could sell that rivalry to the fans over there. Yeah. I don't know. It's so it yeah. seems kind of weird, and it's I've I've never been a fan of these games, but I can see Sweden. I can see some of these places where they go where there's actual hockey talent. But to me, China's really weird because part of the reason the NHL said they didn't want to do the whole South Korea thing is there's no point in growing the game over there. That's why they big reason why they said they didn't want to send players to the Olympics. Now I'm going well. China's no better. Like it's an odd choice to go to China. Well, it just seems like a weird place for an exhibition game to me. Well, if you're just looking at pure demographics, there's over a billion people in China. So if you can get a little bit of the market share, that's a lot of people. And that might increase your revenue. So I can understand it, it but it's literally just dollars and cents. I don't think it has anything to do with like trying to build the game necessarily. Just, but, I mean, you're not going to put a billion people in an arena. Like, I wouldn't imagine you would sell no. any more tickets in China than you would in Russia or Sweden or, you know, some hockey, Czech, Czech Republic, some hockey market. No, but you might get some merchandise sales or people buying, like, Game Center live to, but overseas, so that way they can watch whichever teams. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. I just, I don't know. I mean, I'm not in the NHL's marketing department, but it just seems like an odd place to put an exhibition game. Yeah, like you would figure that if you're going to especially have games in China, that you would try to make it so that you had teams that had players of at least some Asian descent in... Remember last year, what was it? Vancouver hired a goalie. Didn't they play in China some last year and they hired a goalie just for that one game? Yeah. Uh, like, I could see bring maybe Spencer Fu along, but, you know, beyond that, I don't know. Well, just and, a little think, weird. Yeah, and, and I can see... I guess I don't understand it for an exhibition game, too. Like, I think that kind of diminishes it. If you want to do these worldwide games, I think it'd be neat to have opening night of the NHL, nine games from around the world all being played. I have one in Canada, one in the U.S., one in Russia, one in Sweden, one in China. And that, I think, would make for a really cool opening night. Yeah, I agree. You know, like, you can almost simulcast, we're here live at Hockey Night in Canada, now we go to our correspondent in China. And, you know, I, I think that would be really cool. But when you say, let's go all that way for an exhibition game, it just seems like kind of a waste of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I think if you do want to engage the Chinese market, I mean, there's a KHL team over there. Mike Keenan works for them. He's coaching there, I think. So I'd almost say if you're going to do it, you know, you should almost take on their team, like send an NHL team over to take on their team. And I think you're going to build more popularity doing that when you go, oh, can our team stack up to an NHL team? Let's go find out. Yeah, well, then, then you know Edmonton's not going. <laughs> well, then we can send Buffalo. Oh, yes. Um, or may, maybe it's, you know, like the team North America. We send the best of under 24 players. But 
I don't know. It just it seems like a long way to go just to play the Boston Bruins. Yeah. It's it was just it's not so much the game in China that I'm confused about. It's more the matchup of Calgary Boston. Yeah. To do it like you said, put some teams that have a history. Be a Calgary Edmonton, or if you want to feature an East West team, do you know Calgary Montreal? It just it, even it Toronto like, would be some sense. You know, like it, it. It's just like there's no real memorable anything with most of the Eastern Conference teams against Calgary. So. I also imagine if you were to ask Chinese fans what teams you know in the NHL, I could see them saying the Boston Bruins, you know, probably the original six, but I doubt many of them say, oh, Calgary Flames. So it seems like you'd want to send names over there they already know. Yeah. Unless uh, the NHL believes that Calgary has marketable star players, which, okay. Could be, and that's always the interesting thing, too, is when you go that far. I mean, it, it takes away an exhibition game, generally. Yeah. But you also end up sending your star players over there. They want a very star-studded lineup, so it could be interesting to almost see, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Flames did something like a, a, another game with Calgary-Boston at the same time in Calgary or Boston to make it like a split-squad game. Mm-hmm. I could totally see the Flames doing something like that where, okay, we're going to have a bunch of rookies here. Boston, you leave your rookies behind, and let's have the two teams play back in North America. Yep. But just a really, I mean, it hasn't been fully announced yet, but a really weird scenario there. It just, I scratched my head when I saw this news today. Well, I think, Matt, unless there's anything else you want to talk to us, that brings us to the weekly polls. Uh, sure. Uh, the weekly poll, we asked a question two weeks ago before the Flames went in their bye week, and we asked, what do you think the bye week does for the Flames' momentum? And we got three results here. We had 33% of respondents who thought they'd be more energized and rested. The win streak would continue. 33% thought the Flames will lose their momentum and rack up a few consecutive losses, which is exactly what we've seen. And 33% of respondents said their play goes back to what we've seen for most of the season. Nobody thought that the guys would be less banged up and are going to play about 500 hockey for the rest of the month. So for those of you that thought they'd lose some momentum and rack up the losses, you were right. We have a similar question for the coming week. As always, we have a weekly question that we ask anyone who wants to to answer for us. You can go on Twitter and answer it. It's, we're at Fireside Podcast, and we always have a pin to the top of our Twitter feed. You can answer it on Facebook by going to facebook.com slash fireside chat. Again, we have it pinned to the top of our page or on our website. It's right on the homepage at firesidechat.ca. And the question we're going to ask you guys is, as the calendar turns from January to February, how do you think the Flames are going to fare in February? Do you think they'll break even playing about 500 hockey? Do you think they'll fall into a hole and play less than 500 hockey? Do you think they'll play better than 500 hockey? Or do you think they catch fire and go on another big streak? And when I look at the schedule coming up in February, it's an interesting schedule to me. There's a lot of Eastern Conference games, but also not a lot of games that matter points-wise for the Flames. So if if there's a month for the Flames to be giving up points, it's February, because March, there's a lot more games that count. Yeah, and Calgary just needs to play consistent at least for a little bit and try to get their like all the little details going their way realistically they should go on a tear based on the schedule but they should have won several games this week and that didn't turn out so the one thing i think might help is on the six they start a two-week road trip and i think they might just need to get away from home to sort of reset some of their habits yeah and i could see that they had a long break. A lot of them were home with the family or went on vacation. Oh, did they you uh, hear about the Flames and the Oilers vacationing together? No. Yeah, during the break, a bunch of the Flames players and the Oilers players ended up booking at the same hotel and okay. ended up spending the break together. Interesting. Yes. You'd think that with all the hotels in the world that... What hotel? Do we know or where it, was this? It was in Cabo, I think. Okay. They mentioned it during the Oilers broadcast. It's just small world. So, so this must have been a something that's well marketed to NHL players. Yes. Somebody knows their digital marketing. When you're on Facebook, you can do targeting. They say target any male who plays in the NHL in Alberta. Um, either that or they show the same travel agent. Who knows? But yeah, I mean, if we look at it, the Flames have pretty much been at home since the break. They had one trip 
quick trip to Edmonton. Now they're back this week. So I'm really thinking that we might see sort of a rocky week while they finish up at home. And I think this two-week road trip is really what might snap the team back into playing the way they have. But we'll talk about that when we get there. Let's talk about the week ahead first. Flames have three games until we talk to you guys next. The first one is tomorrow night on Tuesday night, the 30th, against the La- the Vegas Golden Knights. This is the first time the Flames and the Vegas Golden Knights ever play, and the first time the Vegas Golden Knights will come to the Saddle Dome. That's a 7 p.m. start. Then on Thursday the 1st, the Calgary Flames host the Tampa Bay Lightning, who we know we did pretty well last time we played them in Tampa. And on Saturday the 3rd, the Calgary Flames play against the Chicago Blackhawks. That's an 8 p.m. start. Then they have a couple games before they go on the road to see the Blackhawks again. But those three games of the home home streak, Matt, how do you think we're going to do? Well, they need four points out of the three games. So I, which four do they get? I think they're going to beat Vegas, and I think they're going to beat Chicago. You think they'll fall to Tampa this time? Yeah. I think they're going to be pissed off after the 5-1 kicking that they got. So... Yeah, that'll be my picks. Yeah, I, I think that there's enough. I think there's probably enough momentum right now with not winning four and you got to win and who better to beat than Vegas. This is the best team. I think the Flames are going to be fired up for this one. And I think if they don't lose, uh, or sorry, if they don't win, that they're going to at least have one point in that game. I totally agree with you. They're going to um, lose to Tampa, and I think they'll beat Chicago. So I'm going to go... I'm going to say that they get one point. They lose either overtime or shootout to Vegas. I then they lose to Tampa and they'll win in Chicago huh. or against Chicago. And then it's pretty much an Eastern swing for the next little bit after that. Yeah. Well, realistically, the Flames just need to keep it up and play well. And as long as they they are getting points, because uh, realistically, the Flames only need to care about the teams in our own division, and. I mean, we as fans want to see wins, but as long as they're not getting zero points, they're doing well. As much as we don't want to see losses in overtime or shootout, I'd rather those because at least we're walking away with a point. Yeah, because like if we walked in and if at the during this show and we lost to Winnipeg and L.A. and we beat Buffalo and Edmonton, we'd be like, yeah, well, we could have done better against those two teams, but hey, we got four points. Eh, it's all right. Yeah, it sucks that we lost all four in a row, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. We got four points. Uh, So as long as the Flames can continue doing well and pushing upward in the standings, then that that will be good. And try to create some separation between themselves, San Jose, LA, and Anaheim. That's the important thing. Right now, looking at sort of what I'm seeing from the Flames, I think you could probably make the argument that if nothing else, right now they really just have to be winning divisional games and getting at least a point against Western Conference competitors. Yeah, because realistically, like everybody, Chicago, uh, Edmonton, Vancouver, and Arizona are pretty much out of it. Like Chicago could bounce back. Everybody else is gone. So... For the non-playoff teams, that leaves you with LA, Minnesota, and Anaheim. Like, as long as we can like outpace those guys, we're good. It's just making sure that they continue to outpace those guys. And it, you also have to look at the fact that the Flames haven't played their best hockey all year yet, and. Well, if they or, ever or have they i mean well that's, that's the scary part well uh yeah well <laughs> if that is it like <laughs> then they have more problems than i also think that looking i mean we we've all, we played 49 games i think looking at the teams below us colorado is gonna fizzle i don't think anaheim lost the pace i think really minnesota and la are the two teams that are going to be struggling to get a wild card spot and I think LA I I don't know they've had some disappointing ends I think that LA ends up fizzling at the end so as long as Calgary can at least last the pace I think they're okay yeah like if I had to pick based on the styles of the teams I I think that Anaheim makes it and I think that Minnesota makes it I think Dallas and Colorado fade so 
We'll see. I just right now I'm not I'm not even too worried about you know who we might play in the playoffs. I'm just worried about us getting to the playoffs at this point. Yeah, as long as we're we've got next by our name, yay! So that way we're not in lotto pick land. Because like exactly. I'm not really like as long as we're in one of the top three spots, I'm not really too scared by any of the teams in our division. Like there's no big bad wolf. Like even Vegas is kind of overblown. So I, I think Vegas I still think as soon as they get to the playoffs, their balloon just, you know, pops. Yeah. Uh, like realistically the only teams in the West that I think have staying power, the central division teams that are in one through three, Winnipeg, Nashville, and St. Louis, everybody else is kinda varying degrees of meh. So uh, as long as the flames can hold on the through all of that then they stand a good chance it's just yeah we'll see well let's see how they do in these three games that end off their home run their home streak here and uh, we will talk to you next week for the flames go on the road thanks for listening everybody have a good week and go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg this episode produced and edited by peter marino Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.